Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining in again. Good to see you. Uh, right. Uh, we finished chapter six in the last class. We looked at uh, the sound requirements, um, sound and technology, the importance of it in worship ministry, and uh, some of the gadgets and equipments uh, names that uh, will be helpful for you to know the different kind of microphones to the speakers um etc cetera, etc cetera. that's what we looked at in the last class uh we are coming to the cusp of uh, finishing uh, the course on worship ministry the last two chapters so that's what we will look at today from chapter seven and chapter eight we kind of combine it okay um so we will look at chapter seven and it says uh, developing a local community as worshiping body developing the local community as a worshiping body uh, what can we do to develop such a community a worshiping community and the importance of it and the importance of uh, congregational worship um, right or, or a corporate worship um, okay and so what we will look at this excerpt is we've studied about this but we were just uh re-emphasizing okay? and it's also taken from the foundations of apc publications um the page numbers have been mentioned over there for your reference okay um so for us to develop a local community as uh for a, a to develop to become a worshiping body uh, one of the first things that we need to do is encourage participation in congregational worship encouraging participation in congregational worship um now before we look into the importance of congregational worship uh can you very quickly uh tell me uh, why is corporate worship important why is it important for uh, the church of god or the people of god to come together why because god dwells in the midst of praising people god dwells uh, in the midst of praises of his people yeah psalm 22 verse 3 okay thank you he dwells uh, that's where he lives he tabernacles that's what that word dwells isn't it uh, literally means he's pitched the tent so he pitches a tent in the midst of his people who are praising him yeah okay and why else uh, it's important what have we learned from the two years of pandemic I think uh, it is in the period we kind of learned um, it doesn't matter if you were an uh, introvert, uh, you did miss people. <laughs> it miss, miss people, uh, you know, shaking on them, it's giving them high fives or shaking hands, and, uh, playing with them. Um, you know, we miss that corporate, the, we miss that connection, isn't it? The presence. Um, we see, you know, presence is something that's beautiful. Presence is the foundation of human connection. Um, so be it, you know, because we relate well to one another's presence when we are present in person, per se, uh, you know, and we begin to understand the significance of God's presence in our lives. Okay, so it's it's kind of inter interrelated. So presence in general is the foundation for human connection. And uh, and that's why uh, you know the first thing you know God, after God creates Adam, He says it's not good for man to be alone, right? So that means there needs to be community, and idea the idea of community begins there, right? And and the growth of a family, uh, and we see that is Jacob and his family. They were, they went into Egypt as a family, but they came out as a nation. Right, God used that 400 years of uh, oppression as an incubation period for them, where they would, uh, you know, go in as a family and then come out as a nation. Uh, so, uh, 
and I think that's the idea of growth uh, from abroad, and that, and we see that towards the very end, which we will look in just a minute, uh, is um, the Bible kind of ends with people from every nation, tribe, and tongue coming together and singing in worship. Okay, but more about that in just a minute. But uh, something powerful happens, and we read that time and time again in the Bible that uh, when everybody lifted up their voice in one accord, when they played as one, uh, you know, so the, the idea of unity, unison, or one accord has been uh, mentioned many times. A and when that happens, when a voice is lifted as one, or when people come together in one accord, um, and we read that in Acts chapter 2 as well, right? It says they were gathered together in one accord. It simply means in one heart, in the oneness of heart. And so it's just like, okay, you know, what we, uh, what uh, John mentioned, God dwells, he, in, he inhabits the praises of his people. He dwells in the midst of his people. And, um, and and there's a lot of good things that happens when he dwells in the middle, isn't it? So, um, yeah, I think to, to say that congregational worship is important is an understatement. The corporate worship is important is an understatement. Uh, right now, this we are not trying to differentiate the importance between personal worship uh, and corporate worship. Both are equally, equally important. Uh, but we're focusing on congregational worship and how to develop as a community. So it's very important that we encourage participation right, in congregational worship. Uh, participation is important, right? You say, come, join. You know, this is when we meet, come encouraging them. Uh, and that itself, trust me, uh, can be very tiring. It can be very discouraging. Sometimes you be like, okay, a pastor, I've uh, followed up with them so many times, so many times. I keep telling them to come; they they don't turn up, uh, and and I agree with you. It is it can be very discouraging, uh, and tiring, exhausting. Whatever you know, whatever you want to add to it, uh, but it, it is what it is. There is no alternative. We continue to do what we have to do. We continue to encourage uh, people. And they and hoping that and praying that they would eventually join in and participate, right? Um, so it's very important that we encourage people to participate, encourage people to show up on time. Uh, is another uh, very important thing, isn't it? Uh, uh, Thomas doubted because he was not there at the right place at the right time. <laughs> so. Uh, um, you know, so encouraging people. See, I I grew up in a Christian family, uh, and I've I've you know, and I've uh, been surrounded by Christians all my life for the most part, right? Uh, you know, church and house and relatives, blah blah blah, all of this, and and I've heard all kinds of uh, statements of Christianese, as we call it. You know, every cliche Christian thing that can be said. In a Christian circle, I've heard them all. Uh, one of the most famous thing, uh, what we Indians are known for, is we have our own standard time. Um, we don't for we <laughs> uh, okay, maybe not all, uh, but it's what it is. You know, we say Indian standard time. Uh, you know, we re look at an invitation. We read 10 a.m. We know it. Re it says 10 a.m., but what we read it and understand it is 11 a.m. Oh, or even 11 30 uh right so what i one of the statements that i've heard uh uh you know growing up around christians is uh is the service starts at eight o'clock and by if we leave at eight o'clock by the time worship finishes by the time or or by the time the sermon starts we will reach on time we will reach the church on time you look at the court I'm not making this up. Uh, I don't have to, but <laughs> I have heard people make statements like this. You know, uh, I'm not sure if any one of you can relate to what I'm saying, or I don't know if it's just me. Um, no. Eight o'clock, the service starts, but 
we have to leave at eight o'clock. You know, we will reach on time by the time the sermon starts. The irony in that statement is uh, is hilarious. But you know, why am I saying this? Is uh, we have to teach people that you know that forty-five to fifty minutes of worship, a congregation or corporate worship, is the only part of the service where we are giving to God. And the remainder of the service is where we are receiving from him. Right? Sure, I mean, we receive uh, encouragement during time of worship as well. But the idea of corporate worship, when people got together, I was glad when they said to me, come, let us go to the house of the Lord. And when you read Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, those 14 Psalms, you will see a title called the Songs of Ascent. The songs of ascent that means now i'm sure there are there were more and what is recorded is those 14 and with the title that says songs of ascent means those were the songs that were being sung as people ascended the hill of the lord because the temple of the lord was on the hill and as they were climbing up they would sing and uh and so there is power in congregational worship there is power in corporate worship so in congregational worship we minister to god Right? It's, it's, it's more vertical. We minister to God. Right? So as a congregation, we minister to the Lord, not with the ulterior motive of receiving a blessing, but rather with the motive to, of blessing Him, whether He blesses us or not. Uh, go through the passage of scriptures uh, in the Bible, uh, both old and new, when it came to congregational worship. Uh, you can you could you can almost see the heart of the people that they never went to worship to gain something. It was a time of celebration. It was a time of exuberance, uh, of you know just boastfully crying out and saying who their God is, celebrating His faithfulness, His goodness, etc. Okay, so why do we need to? Why is it important for us to encourage participation in congregational worship? Because in congregational worship, one, we minister to God. And this was the responsibility of the priests in the Old Testament. The only responsibility of the priest was to minister unto the Lord, right? Offer up sacrifices, make sure that the oil is always there in the lampstand, making sure that the bread is always there in the table of showbread, making sure that there's incense on the altar of incense. Um, right? So, in doing all of that, they were ministering unto the Lord. And we know in the new covenant, Peter calls us as the royal priesthood. And as priests, when you look at the priests in the Old Testament, they never went empty handed before the Lord. Right, they never went empty-handed before the Lord. That means we are encouraged to uh, minister unto the Lord, and then we see that corporate worship brings about a sense of unity within the church. We, uh, in just a moment, uh, in uh, five minutes or so, we will read a scripture from Acts chapter two, uh, and we we'll, just to understand this point a little better. But you know. So the corporate worship brings about a sense of unity within the church, uh, right? From different cultures and backgrounds and ideas, uh, the likes and the dislikes and what have not. We leave the, all the side and we, we say, we are gathered together in the name of Jesus. And there's power in it when we say, you know, people from... Uh, different nations, uh, different states, uh, different backgrounds, different uh, understanding, cultural backgrounds, etc. When all of this, when we come together and we say we love the Lord, we are gathered together in the name of Jesus, it brings, it, it, you know, a sense of unity within the church. You see, yes, we may come from different backgrounds, etc., uh, but we are one body. We are the children of God. Right? So there is this sense of unity that is being birthed in, within the church. And the songs we sing as congregation enable us to learn, teach, and reinforce spiritual truth. Uh, it's a very important point for us to remember. Uh, the songs we sing as a congregation in, in corporate worship enables us to learn, teach. Okay? Look at the progression. We learn. 
and that enables us to teach and reinforce spiritual truth, remind us, right? Uh, emphasize, it empowers us. Um, scriptures that's mentioned uh, in your notes are Ephesians 5.19, we all know this, and Colossians 3.16, it says, speaking to one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Speaking to one another. And so we began with corporate worship as vertical, right? We minister unto the Lord. That's our first priority. And in the third point, we see that it's become horizontal. Right? We encourage one another. We, 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 you know, come, hey, I was glad when they said to me, come, let us go to the house of the Lord. So there's an involvement. There's this encouragement of participation. Say, hey, come. You know, I know Sunday is the only day you get to sleep a little extra, but it's okay. Come. Let's go. Right? Uh, that's the beauty of it. Uh, let the word of Christ, Colossians 3.16, says, dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Um, it's wonderful to see that it's the word of God, uh, is, which is at the core of the church erupting in the song, right? Um, so one of the Hebrew words for praise to erupt in spontaneous song is tehila, if you remember, right? Tehila, uh, which means to burst out in a spontaneous song. And for us, for our hearts to be able to burst out in a spontaneous song, the word of Christ, the word of God has to dwell in us richly. And so no matter what the situation or circumstances, you know what to use, what scriptures to use and make it into a song. Okay, so the songs we sing as a congregation enable us to learn, teach, reinforce spiritual truth, etc. And corporate worship prepares our hearts and provides the atmosphere for the preaching of the word. Okay, uh, again, in Hosea 10, uh, verse 11, you would have heard this scripture. We've, we've mentioned about this in Praise and Worship course. Um, the emphasis is on that uh, three words that says, Judah shall plow. And some of us might wonder, okay, what are we talking about farming now? You know, what's the big deal, Judah shall plow? Why are we learning about plowing? The uh, but you get the idea, right? The imagery that is being painted there, right? It says Judah shall plow, and Jacob shall break his cloths. And so, Judah, it knows, which stands for praise. So as we praise, what is happening is we are preparing our hearts as a church, as one body, to receive from the Lord. We are, we are tilling the land for the rains to come. Okay, so corporate worship prepares our hearts and provides the atmosphere for the preaching of the word, the word which comes from the Lord. Right? And finally, it facilitates us to express the feelings of our heart in uninhabited worship. Okay, so um, how do we develop a local community as a worshiping body? Uh, we need to understand that in congregational worship, we minister to God because uh, uh, it brings about a sense of unity and it enables us to learn, teach, reinforce spiritual truth. It prepares our hearts to receive from the Lord and it allows us, it facilitates us to express the feelings of our heart in uninhabited worship. Right? That is um, just letting go of everything. It's almost undignified. And the second half is how do we develop a congregation in spontaneous worship is we create and develop a culture of worship. Okay, so in the previous uh, section, we learned the importance of it and partly how we can uh, develop that, uh, you know, the culture of congregational worship. But here, how do we develop a similar kind of culture of worship uh, for spontaneous worship? Okay, uh, the four words that we need to remember is revelation, conviction, action, and destiny. Now, once again, if you've gone through the foundation course, uh, you know what we're talking about. 
Um, right, so let's go through them. Revelation leads to conviction, which leads to action, and which leads to destiny, which God has prepared for us. So, revelation is the intellectual or spiritual awareness of what you did not have before. That's what a revelation simply means, right? A revealing or an unveiling. And we get the word uh, veil or unveiling from the word revelation and vice versa. Okay, and so that means you are seeing something new that you have not seen, seen before, or you are aware of something now which you were not aware of, right? Uh, the book of Revelation, it starts off by saying, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, uh, this is a revelation of who he is. So that means you are going to know things about Jesus which you did not know. And then... It goes on to say to, to John, what you see, write. That's all it says, what you see, write. Okay, that means what is being revealed to you, go ahead and make a note of it. Okay, so uh, revelation, it, it, it helps us to understand. Uh, if you remember this conversation of it, between Jesus and the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, Jesus says, you worship what you do not know. But we worship what we do know. What is he saying? That means you have no revelation of what you are worshipping. Yes? And then he makes this famous statement that we all know. The Father is seeking worshippers. True worshippers. Who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? We all are aware of that. And so... Uh, it is the revelation of truth that leads us to become true worshippers. Okay, so when we go through the scripture of Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 8, we all know the famous chapter, Isaiah 6. Uh, Isaiah has this incredible encounter um, you know, with, with, in God's, of God's throne room, of, who this, of his holiness and everything. Right? Uh, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated high and lifted high. Okay, so there's this revelation that has happened. Um, and the train of his robe was filling the temple. Uh, there's one translation that uses the word filling, and I like that uh, because it's present continuous. Uh, the translations will say the train of his robe filled the temple, uh, which is okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's just a personal preference. For I forget which translation. It says the train of his robe was filling Right now, again, I know I've mentioned this, uh, pardon me if I'm sounding redundant, but Isaiah was known, later was known as a prophet of prophets. He was not just a major prophet. He was one of those prophets who had access to the throne room of the kings. Isaiah was related to the king Uzziah, who died. And so he would have access to the throne room. And so he would see the, the throne room of the earthly kings. He had had because he had access. And why is he using the language that the train of his robe mean in those days and during the times of Isaiah, that the longer the train of the robe, uh, the greater the reign of a king. Okay, so uh, the the length uh, of the robe was uh, was displaying the greatness of the reign of the king of that time. And so Isaiah, is, because he has had access to the throne room of the earthly kings, and now he is seeing the throne room of God, he is using the imagery, he is using the tangible to explain the intangibles, so to speak. He is saying the train of his robe was filling the temple. That means his reign was sovereign. Um, there, there is no end to his reign. His reign is great. Right, and so he's having all this beautiful revelation, and he's seeing the the seraphims crying out, "Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty." The whole earth is filled with His glory. Um, now, seraphim is singular. Seraphim also means burning ones. That's what it is. Seraphim is plural. Now, we don't really know. It's it it's possible that we immediately think that okay, there are four seraphim because we think of 
Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4 because there were four living creatures. Um, but Isaiah 6 doesn't really say how many seraphim because seraphim is plural. It's not seraphims, it's seraphim. The singular of seraphim is seraphim. So when it says, you know, the seraphim cried out to each other, uh, we know that they had six wings. With two, they flew, with two, they covered their face, with two, they covered their uh, feet. And they're literally known as the burning ones, right? And so Isaiah is having this incredible revelation and encounter of uh, the throne room of God. And that revelation causes and leads him to conviction. Right? Uh, and so he's seeing this heavenly worship. Uh, you know, and how the, the heavenly beings are in awe of who this God is. And they're crying out to one another, holy, holy, holy. And that causes, that stirs something in Isaiah's heart. What does he say? The famous prayer, woe unto me, for I am a man of unclean lips. It's conviction, isn't it? Um, and then again, we know what happens. The seraphim takes the pole and, and then touches his lips and says that your sins have been atoned for. Uh, that is a very in, uh, interesting statement, which I don't want to get into because uh, we might spend a lot of time on it. Uh, okay, because let's be yeah, it's very tempting, but let's. <laughs> Okay, um, so it leads to conviction. We know what happens, and this conviction will cause action to happen. Uh, whom shall I send? As I said, I will go. Here I am, send me. You can't be convicted. We, we can't be convicted and call ourselves Christians and not do anything about it. Right. Your conviction will always lead to action. It just, it's, it, I, I know it sounds very cool and rhyming, conviction, action, you know, but uh, but if you if you say that you are convicted, uh, you will do something for the Lord. That is, it it it, be, it can simply begin by living a righteous life, a holy life. Right. The conviction will cause action and your actions lead you to the destiny that god has prepared for you right he's he's prepared a destiny for each and every one of us he has a plan he has a purpose he has a destiny uh, for each and every one of us and it is up to us to step into that destiny okay so uh Creating and developing a culture of worship involves all of this. Uh, teach about worship in your churches, uh, the importance of it. Uh, the causes, when you teach what is happening, is you are imparting knowledge. That means, in other words, you are unveiling the topic of worship to your people. Okay, so this is what worship is. And that might lead people to conviction and action, and then eventually into their destiny. Okay, now how do we develop that culture of worship in our lives? Is study the word, pray, exposure. Okay, study the word and pray. Two of the most fundamental things that we've heard since our childhood. Read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. <laughs> pray, pray, pray. Uh, there's nothing, there's no, there's no other secret ingredient here. Right? And then to just uh, for more practical points, say expose yourself to different artists, uh, worship music, uh, whatever you want to expose yourself to. And so all of that uh, will develop that culture of worship in our lives. Uh, you know, one of the one of the things that's helped me personally uh, is, like as I mentioned, uh, the best investments I've made is 10 rupees. Uh, go to OM Books and bought a, a book called Thousand Praises. Uh, ten, it was 10 rupees, I don't know how much it is now in India. Um, a thousand phrases is that just you read. You know, there are, you know, it, it simply says, El Shaddai, I praise you. Jehovah Rapha, I praise you. Jehovah Sid, Sikidna, I praise you. Jehovah Lord, my shepherd, I praise you. My provider, I praise you. My protector, I praise you. And so on and so forth. And like that, there are thousands of it. 
a thousand praises. Uh, okay, so um, what is happening? And those are all scriptures, isn't it? And uh, you are allowing the scriptures, the word of God, or the word of Christ, to dwell in your hearts richly. And so you you never know when 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 you have to erupt in praise. Right. Um, so uh, that's helped me personally, and um, and one of the ways that. Uh, I like to spend my personal time. Um, so if there are, if there's a six, if I if I have an hour's time, I would divide it divide that into three sections of twenty minutes. Uh, twenty minutes of reading the word, twenty minutes of worshiping God. Either I would sing uh, or listen to uh, or put a worship, uh, you know, what uh, music video or worship session online um, and I worship along with them or I just worship alone uh, and the last 20 minutes of praying in tongues so that's uh, the way I've done it and yeah so that's helped me okay so uh, these are the two uh, important ways of us rem uh, is remembering the importance of congregational worship and how we can develop a community of worshippers, and it's very important. Right? And that is actually leading us into the, the last chapter, the importance of indigenous and regional language expression. Um, I, and I think this is very important, the importance of ethnic uh, worship. Uh, right? So I'll just read the excerpt uh, in the notes. It says, as worship ministers, it is important to understand the geographical location of the church ministry and the demographics of those whom we have been called to minister in the congregation. Uh, it simply means uh, you just need to know where you've been placed, where you are, and uh, what language uh, is being used in that area, in that region, so that you can cater to them uh, in the language that they understand. You can minister to them in the language that they understand. Why do we have uh, translations uh, sometimes? You know, uh, uh, is to bless the people. It, 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 that's what communication is all about, isn't it? A part of it, it is. It's not enough just uh, you communicating, but it's very important that you communicate in the language that the other person understands. Uh, right. So. It's very important for us to understand the significance of it, the importance of it. Uh, we can't, uh, in a in a rural setting where a, a certain language is spoken, uh, say for example Hindi, um, we cannot go to a region like that in, in a rural setting like that and uh, try and do all the elevation. Um, so it simply wouldn't cut. You know. I'm not questioning the power of God. Nothing is impossible with him. If he chooses to move, he can move. But that is different. <laughs> Versus uh, the importance of us understanding the geographical location of where God has placed us. And, uh, right? and so what is the importance of it? I just want to uh, mention a few points. And uh, yeah, let's see. So what is his heart? For in indigenous or regional languages of expression or, eth uh, or uh, eth eth uh, ethnic worship, uh, we can look at a few scriptures. Um, Psalm 22, verse 7, 20 to 27. Let me see if I can put it there. Psalm 22, verse 27. It simply says, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. Okay, some more scripture. Psalm 86, verse 9. You can make a note of it uh, if you want to, but I'll, I'll post this in the chat section. Psalm 86, verse 9. That all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. 
Okay, remember we are just looking at God's heart for ethnic worship. He's saying all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you. It's not just English speaking nations or certain language speaking nations, all nations. So the importance of ethnic worship is that is that we bring glory to his name. Okay, uh, and the other, uh, let's move on. So his priority for ethnic worship, we look at Acts chapter, let's go to Acts chapter 2. Okay, uh, now as soon as we mention Acts chapter 2, one of the things that we remember is uh, God pouring out His Spirit, the day of Pentecost, right? And, uh, all of them spoke in tongues. And, uh, and one of the frequent questions that we get uh, when we do a Holy Spirit baptism is how do we know uh, what I'm saying? How do I know what I'm, what I'm speaking in tongues? I don't know, uh, right? But when you look at this passage, the answer is very clear. Uh, uh, let's read a few verses from Acts chapter 2, verse 8 to 11. It says, and how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and, uh, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to a Kyrene and the visitors from Rome. Verse 11, both the Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues, this is very important, the mighty works of God. We forget that part all the time. Is that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, one of the first things that God takes control over was their tongue. Right? And Ephesians 5:18 says, be filled with the Spirit. And one of the fruits or signs of being filled with the Spirit is a surrendered tongue. Because that's the first thing God took complete control over. Right, and that was used to praise him. And so, if anyone asks you this question, uh, and I always say this, it's it's okay. You know, this is what the scripture says. You know, when they when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, when they started speaking in tongues, what they were doing is that they were praising God. They were praising. They were declaring the mighty acts of God. Right? And in Revelation 7, 9 to 12, Revelation 7, 9 to 12, one of the last pictures, uh, as I mentioned a little while earlier, uh, which is recorded in the Bible, images that we get in heaven, is that all nations worship him. Right? Seven, Revelation 7, 9 to 12, it simply says, all nations and peoples and towns stood before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. All nations and peoples and tongues. Now, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what, in which language I'll be speaking when I get to heaven. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I will remember Kannada or Tamil. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I don't have a clear answer. But, but the point here is that every nation, people from every nation, tribe and tongue, they worship. It seems like they worshiped in the language that they knew. Right? That, and so again, this the important that God's priority for ethnic worship is emphasized here. Right, um, and then finally, God's purpose for ethnic worship uh, is again just is that we would all come together and worship and praise Him and bring glory to His name. 
Let's read one last uh, scripture, Psalm 67. Um, I'll just read a few past, few scriptures from that psalm here and there. Psalm 67, it says, Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Oh, let the nations be glad. Okay. Oh, oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase and God, even our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. And so there's a connection of worship and harvest. And so when all nations praise him, then it says, then shall the earth yield her increase. It's simply talking about harvest. Yield is again a, a farming language, uh, which is related to a harvest. That means as we come together in worship, that means souls are being added into his kingdom. And you, you, we know the psalm that says, uh, uh, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. You see how worship leads to harvest of souls. In our context, the worship of cor corporate worship and ethnic worship. Okay, so. Um, yeah, that's in, uh, there are some practical tips mentioned in the notes for you. Uh, go through them when you can. Uh, and then, I mean, these are not the only tips uh, that you need to follow. Um, you know, you can see which will work best for you in your context, in your setting, and adapt to the situation accordingly. Okay, uh, any thoughts, any questions? All right, then, well, if there, are, if there is no question, um, but this is the last chapter of the course. Um, we, yeah, we, we've concluded all the contents. Um, we will not have lectures for next week. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I hope this course has been helpful, um, some sort of an eye-opener, uh, things that you could take away uh, to the church, uh, to your churches. Okay, I will post your final assignment online uh, so you'll be able to see that. Um, so that's about it. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the semester. See you guys. Bye bye. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Bye.